backwards on some old, old material. There is a lot of old material on there, though. Um, so, yeah, you guys. Oh, uh, I should, you're right. But I want them to be in here for the only problem with that is if I don't want to kick them out. But yeah, don't become distracting. Like, if you don't want to pay attention to review, that's one thing. But some people care about their midterm, and it can affect your grade, your semester grade significantly. So, so just, yeah. So you don't pay attention to the review. I'm not going to get on you, but don't distract other people from it, please. Please, please, please. Oh, get a packet. Get one of these. This is the review right there. Put it, hit. Just get Uh, so you guys online, you can download the packet, go to focus. Um, if you do not, well, I'm not supposed to because of COVID, like you're not supposed to change Steve's screen. You truly are telling me. Mr. Gill. Yeah, I can't. I have my glasses. They broke. All right. Well, you're not just trying to sit next to your buddy. Which probably the case. Mr. Goo. What? I got a pencil, please. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Also, Cortez, I'm working on uh, calculators in your classroom. Yeah, Cortez, knock it off, bud. You'd already have, you'd already have two strikes. Well, you know, I've, I've heard you. Like, I hear you nonstop. You not quite. But, no, I'm not even talking about what he said. You're, I'm just saying, like, you've been nonstop ever since you walked in there. I, I hear you when I'm doing stuff. Uh, one left. Yep. Oh, I know what I was showing. I was showing the... So for you guys, again, online, you want to find this. Ah, find this. Um, the name of the assignment is midterm review. There are two attachments, two files. You definitely need the midterm review file. The other file is, is nothing about the review. It's just to show you what your potential grade could be for the semester. But make sure you get the midterm review. That's what I'm going to be going over today. So download that. Uh, if you can't print it out, you can follow along, take pictures of it, what, I don't know, whatever you need to do. But that's the review for the midterm. Um, and where is that? Right here? All right, here we go. All right, we really not, really not concerned about that. So, okay, last time I say it, and then we will go to this. This is a review. Some people care about this. I know some of you don't. Do not distract me. Do not distract them. You will be out. You will be hanging out with Mr. Buck. All right, and it'll be fast today. Because I'm not going to have you affect somebody else's grade. One thing, you don't care about your own grade. Fine. Fail. I don't care. I mean, I do care, but you don't care. How, what can I do about it? But if somebody else cares and you're, you're keeping them from studying, that's good. We don't have problems. I actually don't anymore. What's the name of the last two? Uh, 11 and 12. Today and 12. All right, so. I'm going to do this one real quick. This is all the first stuff we did. And I did, I don't know why I put so much of it on there, but I did put a lot of this on there. I wish I wouldn't have now, but it's on there. The good news is it's all true false on this stuff for the most part. So. If you can just follow along with this, and then I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff after this. Um, if you can just follow along with this, then I think the true faults are not that bad. So we'll see. So we talked about rational numbers and irrational numbers. And we talked about operations, meaning what happens when you add rational numbers or what happens when you add a rational and an irrational or multiply or divide or doing all that stuff with different types of numbers and then we talked about how what is a rational number what is an irrational number so that this is the summary of all of that real fast again i don't know that i went into more detail on the recording in this but you may want to go back and watch it if this isn't making sense because i'm going to keep moving forward so I didn't really use like the math definition behind doing rational and irrational because it's very complex. And I don't know that it would help you understand it any more than this does. We talked about people being rational and irrational. 
Rational, if a person is rational, what did that mean? Remember? Yeah, they make sense. Like they like, they're very logical. They like things that make sense. You can almost think of them as kind of like calm people, sort of. I said I was a rational person. I like things that make sense. Let's say Benjamin is a rational person also. So when Benjamin and I, we're two rational people, we both like things that make sense. So when we have a conversation, we want that conversation to make sense. Like rational person, rational person, we have a rational conversation that makes sense. It's the same way with number. If you have two rational numbers, and, and in, when it comes to two rational numbers, this is the easy one because it doesn't even matter what math operation. It could be addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, um, any math operation. If you have two rational numbers, your answer is going to be rational. Just like when we have a conversation, our conversation is going to be rational. Now, let's say I'm rational, but now I'm going to have a conversation with Cortez. Cortez is not rational. He's irrational. Irrational means he doesn't always make sense. Sometimes he goes, he says crazy stuff sometimes. If I have a conversation with him and I'm trying to make sense and he's not making sense, that's going to make me really frustrated. And I'm going to get frustrated and angry. And now, because he's irrational, our whole conversation becomes irrational. So now let's talk about numbers. If we have a rational number and an irrational number, when you... Mm, I'll say combine for right now. When you combine those, your answer is going to actually become irrational almost all of the time. There is an exception. Um, I'll tell you right now, you don't have to worry about the exception. I did not put the exception on the midterm. But just so you know, there is an exception only for multiplication and division. So if you're multiplying a rational number and an irrational number, there's one number, so let's say we have an irrational number. Now, we'll explain in a second what those are. That's an irrational number. If I have a rational number like three, if I multiply or divide those, that's going to be irrational. If I add them, that's going to be irrational. Like I said, any rational number, any irrational number combined gives you an irrational answer except for one exception. That exception is that. Because if I multiply, now if I add them together or subtract, it's still irrational. Because 10 subtract, or the square root of 10 subtract zero is just the square root of 10. So I don't change the value of it. But if I multiply those, what do I get? Oh, come on. Square root of 10 times zero. 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 Anything times zero is zero. Well, this is a rational number. So that's the only exception for a rational and a, I'm sorry, an irrational and a rational becoming rational or staying rational. It's just zero. Any other irrational number and rational number, any other rational number, one, two, three, five, ten, a million, negative 72. Point two, any other one, and it's going to be irrational. And I didn't put the exception on there. So for your sake, rational number and an irrational number gives you an irrational answer. That's the first thing we did in class. So now we got to figure out, well, how do we determine if a number is rational or irrational? I always forget whether or not I started reporting. Yeah. How do we determine if a number is rational or irrational? Well, here's the short version. Not right now. Let me at least get through this one because I put a lot of stuff on the quiz from this one. I did. I, I don't know. I don't know why. It didn't seem like a lot when I was doing it, but I think it's a lot. So any number that's a fraction, two sevenths, negative 17 twelfths, um, point 1001, uh, negative 0 0.0004. Any number that is just a decimal or a fraction, and then obviously like whole number zero, 
negative 10. Those are all rational numbers. As a matter of fact, the only way you can have an irrational number, well, this is irrational, pi, sometimes pi is just written like that, not curly. Pi is irrational. It's so irrational, we can't even write it as a number. We have to use a symbol for it. That's pretty irrational. So pi is always irrational, if you see that. I didn't put it on the quiz, but it is. Only other way you can have an irrational number is if you have that symbol somewhere in the number. Now, having that symbol does not automatically mean it's irrational. You got to do a quick check to figure out if it's irrational. And here's how you do that. So if you'll notice, all of these without that symbol, 1/4, 1 0 0.6, 1.8, 1.01, .01, those are all rational. They don't have that symbol, so they have to be rational. But these have that symbol in them. So there's a way that we check to see whether or not they're rational or irrational. We need to see, can we simplify that number and make, get, basically, can we get rid of that symbol? That symbol means the square root, by the way. So for this one, we can rewrite, or for any of these, we can rewrite those problems like that. Square root of four over the square root of nine. <clears throat> What's square root of four? Two, right? What's the square root of nine? Three. Three, right? Did we just get rid of those that symbol? Those symbols? Yeah. Huh? Sure we did. We just have two thirds now. We went from this down to this. Now we don't have that symbol anymore. So that is a rational number. We started with this, but the value of that, the simplified version of that, is just two thirds. So we have a rational number. You can get rid of that symbol, you have a rational number. So now let's look at the other ones real quick. Uh, square root of five, is there any way we can get rid of that symbol? It's really not like the square root of four would be two, but the square root of five, there's nothing we can do with it. Can't simplify that in any way. So that's irrational still. We were not able to get rid of that symbol. That's still irrational. Uh, square root of 10, even though that's not one of the problems. Can we get rid of that symbol? No, uh, because three, square root of nine would be three, so we can get rid of that way. Square root of 16 would be four, but the square root of 10, that's going to be like 3.19 or 3.21 or somewhere in there. Can't get rid of that. Uh, what about square root of 25? Because we could rewrite it. Yeah. It's a fraction. What's square root of 25? Five. Five, right? What's square root of 16? Four. So we got rid of those. So that's a rational number. What about this one, 12 thirds? Can we get rid of that? We rewrote that. So if we could rewrite that as square root of 12 divided by the square root of three. Can we get rid of that? Can't get rid of either of those, right? Now, if you could get rid of one of them, but you still have one left, that's still irrational. You gotta get rid of both of them when you do it. So like, let's say here, if this would have been over 10, like if that was a zero, well, we could have made that square root of 25 over square root of 10. So that equals five, but we still had the square root of 10 down there, if that was the problem now. So even if you have one of them left, then it's still irrational. You got to get rid of all of them, both of them. So here, can we get rid of either of these? No. So is that rational or irrational? Irrational. So irrational, is everybody good with that? We didn't get rid of them, so irrational. You're all wrong, it's rational. What's your, what's your deal? You just told us we can't get rid of it. It's, it's irrational. Well, there's something you gotta check before you do this one. We couldn't do it in this one, we couldn't do it in this one, we couldn't do it in that one, but let me ask you this question. What's 12 divided by three? So we really have that. Before you do this process where I do this whole thing and I split them up, before you do that, divide out first. 
just in case. Now here, we couldn't divide this. We couldn't simplify this. It's still four ninths. Same way here. Here, it's still 25 tenths or 25 sixteenths. Here, though, we can divide that out and make it into a simpler number. So just make sure you do that first before you start to do this whole process of splitting them out. So in that case, we did get rid of it. That's just equal to two. Um, when you have a decimal, it's a little tougher. I will tell you the shortcut version. And I didn't give you any decimals on there anyway. If you have a calculator, just hit square root button on your calculator. And if it gives you a, like a, a number that doesn't look really weird, meaning it goes on forever and there's no pattern, you hit the square root button, that'll tell you immediately whether it's rational or irrational. Like if you hit the square root button on this, you put in 0 0.09 square root, it'll give you 0 0.3. So that's a rational number. If you hit the square root button on five, you're going to get like 2.237190. It'll go on forever. It'll go really weird. I guess that's. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, real quick, is the quotient of 10 and 5 a rational, or square root of 10 and 5 a rational number? Raise your hand if you think it's rational. Raise your hand if you think it's irrational. Raise your hand if you still don't know. All right. So again, going back to the conversation, our general rule, there is an exception to this, but we're going to go with the general rule. If you have a rational person, makes sense, and an irrational person, when they have a conversation, the, the irrational person, the crazy person, is going to make the other person crazy. Crazy, crazy makes crazy. All right? So irrational and rational numbers are going to become irrational. Again, there's one exception when you have zero, but we're not going to worry about the exception. So this, it doesn't matter what... Quotient means division, by the way, if you don't remember that. So this is not a rational number. If you have one of each, irrational and rational, it is not rational, it's irrational. So what about number 10? Is the difference of square root of 18 and three a rational number? Is it rational? Raise your hand, you think it's rational. Raise your hand, you think it's irrational. It's irrational again, because again, we got the same thing. This is an irrational number. This is a rational number, so that means it all turns to irrational. I did not go over what if you have two irrational numbers. Didn't go over that because there's there's more exceptions to that, and I don't have time in a review to, to go over the whole lesson. But um, if you can just try to come up with it, like if they ask you, I, I'm not going to ask you a question about it, so you don't have to worry about mine, so we're not going to worry about it. All right, so next page, I think it's just like one step equations. We're skipping that. Oh, there. So one, I'm sorry, two step equations. We're skipping two step equations. That's on the review if you want to go back and watch it. Um, oh, oh, there is one word problem. You need to know how to do this. I'm not going to go over it. I did this on the recording. YouTube, my channel, if you don't know how to do it, you look up Mr. Gill Algebra, and then you look for the picture of my dog. I'll show you on the bell work in a second. So you need to know how to do number 13. Oh, wait, do you? Well, I don't remember. I don't think I put that on there. So actually, you don't need it. I, I put it on the review, and I meant to put it on the thing, and I totally forgot to put it on the midterm. Oh, so I guess you don't. So don't worry about it. I really like that problem too, that's it. Uh, we do have a word problem though, similar to some of those word problems, but I'll get to word problems in a minute. So next sheet, one, three, I'm not gonna go over this one. Um, solving equations with variables on both sides. So I go over how to do the distributive property. You definitely need to know how to do that. Um, and then I go over how to, you know, solve a, a complex equation basically so that's recorded there's actually a bunch of recordings on that uh, literal equations i'm not going to i might come back to this if we have time at the end but i want to make sure i get through the rest of the stuff on the recording that other people haven't seen again poor first period it's not going to get to look at anything but 
So literal equations. The one thing I will say, if they ask you to solve an equation for a variable, but you have multiple variables in the equation, right? I got multiple variables in all of these equations. You cannot come up with a number for your answer. Way too many of you see that word solve in there, and then you think, oh, I got to come up with a number. No, not coming up with a number. It's driving me crazy, those of you not paying attention on your phones and stuff, but I'm not. That won't happen again next class when we get back to normal, so just don't think that I've changed. Just not worried about it today. I'm trying to get through the review. All right. So. I cannot come up with a number answer because I have two variables. The only way I would be able to come up with a number is if they told me something like, well, n equals three. Well, then I could get rid of the n and now I only have one variable. But if you have two variables, you can't come up with a number. So your final answer is going to have a, a variable in the answer part. So like when I solve out, m is going to equal seven subtract 3n. That's the final answer. That's it. That's all you can do. And I show you on the video how to do solve a couple of those, so I'm not going to go through it right now. You can go back and watch it. If I have time, I'll come back to that one. That page. I mean. All right, so let's see if we're starting on this page. All right, so I'll mention a couple of things. Again, this one's already recorded, but I will mention a couple of things. When you solve inequalities, it's the same exact steps as a, an equation. Right, there's nothing you do differently until the end. There's one, and sometimes you don't even do this. Sometimes, though, you have to make a change that you don't have to do with equations. So I'm going to solve this out real quick. Again, I go through it slower on the video. So I add plus three, plus three, ignore that one. So negative 16 and negative 4t is where I get to. I'm at the last step. You don't recognize it, we're at the last step of solving an equation. I have negative 4t, I'm gonna write it bigger over here so you can see. This is the important part. Negative 4t is less than negative 16. What's my last step in solving an equation? Because remember, we do the same steps. So even though it's in an inequality, in, in inequality we still are going to have the same last step, only we got to change one little thing. What's the last step? Divide. Divide. Good. Look at that. I haven't been here in months and getting the answer nobody else saying. We divide by negative four. So here's the change you have to remember when you do an inequality. You don't have to worry about this for equations, but you do for inequalities. If I divide, or if my last step is dividing by a negative. So I had a negative and I divided by the negative, right? Which means I got to divide by the negative over here. If I divide by the negative, I have got to flip that symbol. That's the only thing you've got to remember that's different for inequalities. So now, so those cancel out. So now I get t is greater than positive 4. It's negative 16 divided by negative 4 is positive. You will have calculators on them. That's the only thing you got to remember. Everything else is the same. Doing the distributive property is the same. I go over that on the video. Um, Combining variables is the same, moving variables from one side to the other side, all the same stuff. You just have to remember the last step. If you divide by a negative number, you got to flip the sign if it's an inequality. All right, so next page. Oh, you do have to graph, but we're going to do that on this page. All right, so now these are called compound inequalities. Um, what's the difference? Do you remember the difference between a compound inequality and just an inequality? These are just inequalities. 
These are compound inequalities. They look pretty similar, right? Here's what you're looking for to know how to solve them. How many of those symbols in every problem? Well, in each problem, per problem, how many of those symbols are in there? Per problem, see if you paid attention. You know, one. one. In this problem, there's only one symbol. In this problem, there's one symbol. In this problem, one. There's one symbol in each of those problems. However, how many symbols are in these problems? Yeah, for each one of these problems, you'll notice there's two symbols. Even if they give you a different setup, oh, not over there. Even if they give you a different setup, like here they have the word or and they actually give you two separate equations, still two symbols. There are also two equations in those, as opposed to the three and four just have really one equation. Technically, they are two equations, which we'll go over. So yeah, if you see two symbols in the same problem, that means it's a compound inequality. So you actually have to do two equations, solve twice, then you graph that final solution. So let's talk, I'm not gonna worry about doing these. The equation is already given to you. You would solve for M, solve for M. So you do it twice, solve for B, solve for B. I'm gonna go over how to do one of these. Um, just like I said, there are two equations in that problem. Doesn't look like it necessarily, but there are. So you need to know how to break that out into the two equations. Whatever you do, do not separate the term that's with the variable, the expression that's with the variable. Don't break that up, ever. That has to stay together. That's the equation part. So you would create two equations by saying negative four. I hate putting y like this, but that's fine. And then y plus two. I didn't change the symbol or anything. When we learned this before, I told you to flip the sides. So if you do it that way, that's fine. But I'm not telling you right now. I'm doing this pretty quickly. Then we would write over here. Again, we don't break the y plus 2 up. You'll notice I use the y plus 2 twice in, in each equation. I have that. Now we just solve for y. So if I'm going to solve for y, I would subtract 2, subtract 2. I would get y is less than negative 6. And then over here, subtract 2, subtract 2. I get y. Oh, that's actually y is greater than. Uh, negative 12. Really? There, that's correct. So we have y is less than negative 6, y is greater than negative 12. And then don't forget, there's a word that goes in there, and. That means y has to be both of those things. It has to be less than negative 6 and it has to be greater than negative 12. Um, and my classes are running together. When we talked about going to the store to buying something, we only had $10. Did I already do that example over again? Uh, I don't think so. All right, so I go into the store. I have $10 to buy. That's, a, that's an inequality. Because I can choose to spend all 10 or not. Like I could spend different amounts. I don't have to spend exactly 10. So what is my rule? Like what's my restriction or my requirement? What's my rule? If I have $10 in my pocket, that's all the money I've got. The amount of money I spend has to be what? Has to be equal to 10 or less than 10. I don't have to spend all my money. That was the rule we said when we first started doing inequalities or when we first started doing um, 
equation back. We're forgetting a rule there, though, or we're leaving a rule out. What's the other rule? There's actually a second rule of that when I walk into the store. It's got to be equal to or less than 10, but there's another restriction when it comes to math. In reality, you don't really think about this one, but when it comes to math and graphing, because we're going to want to graph the solution, what's the other restriction? I'm getting zero participation from your site. This is more for the people at home now. So if that's my zero. This is the dollar amount that I spend. I cannot spend a negative amount of money. This is not possible. You can't go into the store and say, I'm going to spend negative $3. You can spend zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, anything in between those, but you can't spend a negative amount. So we have a restriction that the money I spend, so I'm just going to put a dollar sign, it could be less than or equal to 10, or it could be, it could be greater than or equal to zero. Did you ask earlier? So the idea then. Um, so there is a second rule. This is a compound inequality. So when I don't come in disturbing the class, hey, hey, don't disturb the class. That's, that's got to go up. I stop. As soon as I stop, it's got to go up. Because you guys have been doing this all class and I've talked over. So. Don't. Don't mess somebody else's review up. Even though most people are sleeping, if even one person is paying attention, which I do have one, that's about it. All right, so when I graph this, when I graph this, well, if I'm talking, then I might. Um, if I graph this, if if the variable, which in this case the dollar is spin, is the variable. I don't know how much that is yet. If the variable is in between the two numbers in the equation or the inequality, compound inequality, if it's in between, then when I graph, my shaded region is going to be in between. It's the only way to do it. That's a pretty simple one to pick out. Well, it's any of those, any value in between them. I could spend one, I could spend zero, one penny, two pennies, three pennies, four pennies, all the way up to ten dollars. Everything in there is a possible solution. That's what the shaded region means, by the way. Those are all my possible answers. Or in this count, in this case, all the possible amounts of money I could spend. So when we go through and we graph, first of all, you got to solve it, which we did. We got our answers were these two numbers. So when we go to graph that, when we go to graph that, oh boy, I'm not going to be able to fit all of these in the graph. Okay. So when we go to graph that, I would do the same thing. I put a circle on negative six. I would, oh, shoot. It would be an open circle, unfortunately. Um, there. Negative seven, negative six, negative five. So, I mean, do you, can you just not help it? I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's you or if it's her. So I put a circle on negative six. Uh, open circle on negative 12. And again, if the variable is in between the two numbers in the original equation, then the shading is going to be in between whatever the final two numbers are. That should be a pretty easy one. It's in between, and now you may have to create the graph yourself, but when it comes to doing the shading part, if the variable's in between, your shading better be in between, whatever the two numbers are. All right, so that's all I'm doing for that one. Again, I think I might have done a little bit more on the review yesterday. How are we in here? 
20 after 20 after again oh yeah because i guess every class is a total of an hour including the break uh all right so graphing man are we still struggling with graphing i'm going to show you how to graph because you there's a couple graphing problems at least two if not even more than two so when you graph I don't make you create the graph. I give you a graph, unlike the worksheets. This is just y equals mx plus b. And we said, well, we know there's two pieces of this that will give us enough information to graph. That is the y-intercept. That's where my line is going to hit the y-axis. So I know a point's going to have to go through there, because that's where I'm going to have to hit. So. The B value in this equation is the number that's all by itself. So I can go ahead and start by putting a dot and I'll make it pretty good sized dot so hopefully you can see it. Now that I, that's my first point. Now I need my second point. Well, we said the way I know my second point is from the slope which is just the number that's in front of the X. X is not part of the slope. So, this whole thing, and again, phones will not be out next class. And I don't just mean the exam class, I mean the phones. Today is a huge exception. It's driving me crazy seeing it. So, I now need to say, okay, well, if my slope is negative five, I know that the formula for slope is rise over run. I need though to make that into two numbers because I need a rise and a run number. So I need to put it over one. And I need to say, all right, well, positive one means I go right one. Negative five means I actually go down five because it's a negative rise negative rise means you actually go down so i would go right one down one two three four five so that would be my second point and then you draw a line that would go through uh, that's a horrible line but you get a point so again we did that for a long long time you guys actually did it again last monday but we still struggled on the, the last quiz with it. Uh, so we'll see how you do a midterm because there are questions on there with that. And I think there's actually three, not two. All right, so next, you also have to know how to do the opposite. So instead of getting an equation and creating a line, on one of the problems, I give you a line and you have to pick the equation or create the equation. I forget which it ever is. So, for example, on these, there. So now you have a line. So you don't know the equation for that line. You have the line. So you need to be able to say, okay, well, what's the equation? So you just kind of go back and forth. You need to find, well, I know in this formula, I know in that formula, that's my y-intercept. So that is the first thing I'm going to look for for that line. Well, my line crosses the y-axis right there at 1. So that's going to be the end part of my equation. That alone might eliminate a couple of questions. That, question. that alone might eliminate, because one, of, one or two of them, I think, is multiple choice. So even if you don't know how to solve it, if you can at least just say, well, I know that y-intercept is wrong, I know that y-intercept is wrong, that might eliminate enough where you can take a much better guess. Um, so if you want to just, I'm assuming that's that for each person. So now I need to figure out what is my rise and my run number? I need to figure out how do I get from this point to any other point on the line? But the key is it's got to go through the corners of squares so that we can use a nice round integer. So I'll just pick that one. Doesn't matter which two I pick. So my rise over my run is my formula. And I need to say, all right, well, what are my rise and run numbers to go from here 
again, I always choose to go right personally. I go right two, so my run number is two. I go up one, two, three, four. I count how many hops I make. So I count the hops. So four was the number of hops. Four divided by two is two. So my slope, my M value is two. So that's the um, equation for that particular line. I'm not gonna do the other ones, same process. I will tell you, if you at least pick out the fact that your y-intercept right there is four, so you know the end of the equation is plus four, that will help you eliminate some options. Also, oh, I didn't go over this. Well, I'm recording this though. Remember, a line that slopes left to right, that slopes up or that goes up from left to right. So if I'm on the left side of this line, that's me. I'd be walking up that line. If I'm on the left side of this line, though, I'm walking down this line. If you're walking up the line, that's a positive slope. If you're walking down the line, that's a negative slope. If you just know, well, I know in this problem, the, the y-intercept is plus four. So the end of that equation is going to be plus four. I also know the slope better be negative, right? So whenever I figure out, if I know how to figure out m, it better be a negative number. Just between knowing those two things and never ever trying to figure out the actual number for slope, you might be able to get the right answer. A lot of times on the district test, you will be able to get the right answer. It's not going to be as hard on my midterm. But I'm not, not going to be as easy on my midterm. Uh, I didn't put anything on there like seven, eight, nine. I will tell you what I did put on there as far as a word problem goes. So when it comes to word problems, the word problem is based on this equation. It's based on a rate of change or a slope and then some kind of y-intercept, like a starting value. So for example, if you are going to, let's say you're raising money, you're going to raise money for something. And you want you have a goal of a thousand dollars and you're at three hundred dollars and you want to know well how long is it going to take me to raise money from here? Like how many more do I have to sell if I'm selling candy bars? So your starting number is the three hundred you're already at. So that would be your starting number. So it would be plus the three hundred at the end. If candy bars are two dollars each, the money from candy bars would be two x because it's $2 each. Remember, this is based on per or each. And then X would be how many more candy bars you need to sell. So that's kind of similar to the question that's on the um, midterm. You're going to have a starting value. that's kind of like a one-time value. You, just, you don't use that 300 again. 300 doesn't keep getting added in. The only one that keeps getting added in, ooh, keeps getting added in is the two dollars because every time you sell a candy bar you get two more dollars so that's kind of how the word problem works sort of it's not exactly like that by any means um uh, okay so standard form there is graphing on standard form yeah there is So, well, I got to hurry up. So I've got to do the quick version on this. Standard form, the shortcut version we use. The real version is you plug in zero for one for X, then you solve for Y. You plug in zero for Y, and then you solve for X. The shortcut version was just cover up one of them and solve. So if I cover that up, Y just equals negative 10. All right, well then let's do the same thing, only let's cover up y this time. I cover up that and I solve. Well, I got to divide by negative five, divide by negative five, and I get x equals two. So you cover up one term, solve for the, the variable that's left. Then you cover up the other term, solve for the other variable. Whatever number you get is just what you would plot on the graph. So I don't have, I'm not gonna create the graph. 
something like this though. Y equals negative 10 would be way down here. X equals two would be right here. So your line would be super steep like that. Um, again, the main thing is cover up and solve. Cover up and solve. If you remember how to do the plug, there's no open notes. I don't know if I mentioned that, but it's not open note midterm. You gotta know how to do this stuff. Midterms don't use notes. Finals don't use notes. Uh, and I didn't do that next section, so we we'll skip that. Um, domain and range, I don't think I put anything on that, so I'm gonna skip over that. You do need to know how to identify a function though. So, um, if I have, I'm going to rewrite because they don't give you a table on this sheet and I did give you a table. I'm going to rewrite number four into a table. Ignore number four. Um, actually, I'm going to change. Oh, yeah, I can't really change it. If you are determining whether or something is not something is a function, if you have just a lot of x and y values in ordered pairs, the first thing you look for is what? If you're trying to determine if it's a function, you might remember. First thing you look for is, are any of the x values even repeated? If no x value is repeated, it's automatically a function. It has to be. So if you don't see duplicated x values, like a repeated x, which I don't see one there, negative 4, negative 3, 1, 3, 5, that's automatically a function. I don't even care what's going on with the y value. I could have this. I could have either ordered pairs, so... 3, 1, and they don't have to be in order necessarily. I could have that. The Y is repeated every single time. There's only one Y, and that's one. But I don't have an X that repeats, so it doesn't matter. It's automatically a function. If you look at it in a table form, still the same solution. If I don't have an X that repeats, which I don't, that's automatically a function. But what if I had an X repeat right there? Is that a function now? X just repeated. I got negative two again as an X. Is that a function, yes or no? Somebody said no. Anybody think yes? And you all get zero. It is a function. I can repeat an X, that's fine. It doesn't matter if I repeat it, as long as I get the same number there, which I did. If that would have been any other number other than four for this second one, any other number here, then it would not have been a function because I put in negative two the first time and I got four for my output. Every time I put in negative two, I better get four for my output. So if I get anything except for four, it's no longer a function. Um, what is the, and please, well, I guess I don't care if you back up today. Just don't be disruptive because I'm going to go until the bell rings. How do I tell from a graph if it's a function or not? This is the probably the easiest thing. Vertical line test. I take something that's a vertical line and I go left to right. If I don't hit two points at once, which I don't on this, there's no spot where I hit two points. If I'm looking at vertical lines, none of these vertical lines ever hit two points. They just go through one spot on that line. That means it is a function. If you hit two lines at the same time, or two, any two points at the same time, then it's no longer a function. How do you tell from this if it's a function? How do you tell from that? A diagram, mapping diagram. Yeah, if you, I don't even care what's going on over here again. Kind of like I say, sometimes you don't even care about what's going on with the output. If you have two lines coming off one of the input numbers, one of the x values, that is not a function. Two lines coming off of one x, 
means it is not a function. As long as that doesn't happen, though, it is a function. Ah, uh, and then last but certainly not least, I think it's on. Oh no, maybe it's on the next one. Yeah, so we did this recently. So the quick version is if I, if they are telling me this right here, all they're telling me when they say this f of negative three, they want to know what is the answer when x equals negative three. So f of negative three just means, well, x equals negative three. Now I just solve out the equation using negative three. So I would just use this equation and plug in negative three. Then for the second problem, it tells me to use the same thing. So I just plug in negative three and I just plug in negative three for x. They're just telling me that x equals negative three by putting negative three in these parentheses because they're basically replacing that, substituting that, with a negative three. So again, that just means x equals negative three. So this is the answer. So f, oh, there we go. So f of negative three is the answer to the equation when x equals negative three. So f of negative three is the answer. Just the negative three is what x equals. So don't get those confused because that's important on the quiz. You need to understand that f of negative 3 is the answer to the equation. Negative 3 is just what x is. And I think we went over, this is the same thing as graphing y equals mx plus b, so there's no difference there. Just instead of f of x, you could think of it as y. Same exact thing we did a second ago when we graphed. So that's pretty much the whole midterm, other than what... I skipped this recording. So, if you want to watch the recording, you should be in good shape. Uh, you guys online, I'll have to email you the exam on that day and you'll take it. I don't know how I'm going to do it with you guys, though. It's pretty impossible. Hey, John. But. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John.